And uh, our last speaker, Dr. Stuart Carr, uh, he's a consultant uh, immunologist uh, allergist and the chief medical officer at the Snow Asthma and Allergy Center in Abu Dhabi. Thank you. Our slide's going to come up, or ah. All right. Thanks, and and I think this uh, this hopefully will follow the last uh, session well, talking about um, maybe more definitive management for food allergy. So uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm a pediatric allergist and immunologist. I've been in Abu Dhabi for the last four years, uh, having spent the previous 20 years in clinical practice in Canada. And so we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about um, oral immunotherapy, what it is, why would we be considering it, what's the data around the safety and efficacy of this treatment, and I'm going to go over a few recent papers that talk about um, oral immunotherapy in young children. I've got no relevant disclosures for this. So as was mentioned, look, food allergy is, is quite common and, and it has a very significant impact on quality of life. Um, there's been very clear increases in the rates of food allergy and food allergic conditions like eosinophilic esophagitis over the past few decades, and that kind of follows uh, increases in allergic rhinitis in the first half of the last century, and then increases in the rates of asthma and atopic dermatitis in the sort of last half of the last century, and now food allergy seems to be following in that sort of epidemiological trend. And as was just mentioned, you know, up until really recently, the standard approach for managing food allergy was avoid the food, hope for the best, carry an auto-injector, uh, knowing that you're at risk to have accidental exposures uh, and, and potentially very severe reactions. We're very lucky in the allergy world that a relatively small number of foods is responsible for the overwhelming majority of food reactions. And as you can see here, if you look in, in you know, young children, almost all anaphylaxis is food related. And as kids get older and move into adolescence and adult life, you start to see other triggers for anaphylaxis emerging, things like insect stings and drug allergies, um, allergen immunotherapy, injection, skit. Um, but, but really, in very young children, which is really the focus of my talk today, it really is food-driven, and a small number of foods is responsible for the overwhelming majority of food reactions. Um, foods like milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, and sesame seed is responsible for over 95% of food allergy. And it can be hard to avoid food allergens. Some of the foods we talked about, last speaker was talking about milk allergy. Foods like milk and, and egg and wheat, these are staple foods that can be very challenging to avoid. And even foods like you know, peanuts and tree nuts and sesame here, for example, in this part of the world, really ubiquitous exposures and very difficult to avoid. Studies suggest that the average person will have an accidental exposure every couple of years uh, and the majority over a five-year span. If I see somebody who has gone many, many, many years without an accidental exposure or suspected reaction, it makes me more um, suspicious that they may have outgrown the allergy or maybe it was a misdiagnosis in the first place. You know, and as was mentioned, we are seeing increased rates of anaphylaxis. Luckily, fatal reactions are exquisitely rare. I mean, as, as was mentioned, you kind of hear about some of these case reports. It is really unlikely to die from food allergy. And that's something that we spend a lot of time with our families emphasizing because parents are under the misconception that it's quite likely, and, and in one study of mothers of peanut allergic kids, about a third of them thought it was likely or very likely that their child would die from peanut allergy when it is astronomically unlikely. In one study, children are, are shown to be three to ten times more likely to be murdered in any given year than to die from their food allergy. So it's really important to have a perspective on that. I always say to my patients, they take a bigger risk driving to see me by far than living their life with a food allergy. But again, you can see that there's a lot of psychological baggage that's associated with food allergy, and this can really impact quality of life. I was talking to a family just recently from Saudi Arabia. Um, met them on, on a teleconference, and they've never traveled, and they've never eaten in a restaurant because of their child's suspected peanut allergy. That's how afraid they are, and that's just no way uh, to live their life. 
So what is immunotherapy? So most of you are probably familiar with immunotherapy because of environmental allergen immunotherapy or bee sting allergy immunotherapy. And the idea is trying to retrain the immune system not to care so much about the allergen. And really all the studies that have looked at food immunotherapy, and these are relatively recent over the past two decades and especially over the past four or five years, they all take a fairly similar approach, a similar approach which is first it's critical to confirm that an actual allergy is present. A huge part of my job is reassuring patients and their families that they're not actually allergic to the foods that they've been told they're allergic to, whether it's based on the history alone, which is notoriously unreliable, or whether it's based on uh, inappropriate testing. Um, the all too ubiquitous panel testing for food allergies that, that I'm sure most of you have run across in your clinical practices are incredibly unreliable. Panel testing for food allergies has a positive predictive value of 2%, so 98 out of 100 chance of being wrong. So it's really important that we have an accurate diagnosis. So for many patients, if we're thinking about treating their food allergy with something like immunotherapy, then we are absolutely looking at doing an oral food challenge unless they've had a very clear, recent, convincing clinical reaction. An oral food challenge is, uh, uh, the last speaker was commenting that they can be quite uh, difficult, and they're really actually not, not that difficult. As somebody who has now more than 20 years of practice and, and not in a hospital-based setting, uh, oral food challenges are quite feasible on a, on a regular clinical basis for a specialty clinic. I'm not suggesting that this should be a routine part of general pediatric care, but in an allergy clinic, that's certainly something that we're quite comfortable and familiar with. Once we've got a firm diagnosis, then the approach for immunotherapy is to start by introducing very, very, very tiny doses of the food allergen and gradually increasing this towards some sort of predetermined target dose, which is then used as maintenance therapy for some predetermined period of time to see if that alters the patient's immune response. So when we talk about immunotherapy, it's important that we kind of are speaking the same language. There's really two outcomes that can happen with immunotherapy when it's successful. One is the desirable outcome, which is just tolerance. They've basically cured the allergy. The person can eat whatever, whether they stop eating the food or don't, they're not going to react to it anymore. And as for all intents and purposes, the allergy is over with. Desensitization is more achievable, less desirable for a lot of patients, but it's achievable in a much higher percentage, which is that we raise their threshold of reacting to a point where accidental exposures, minor exposures are no longer able to trigger a reaction. And for a lot of families, that may be very beneficial. People who have frequent episodes of anaphylaxis are, are very excited about the possibility of raising their threshold. With desensitization, it may be a much more transient phenomenon. If, the, if their exposure is interrupted, they may revert back to a hypersensitive state fairly quickly. But what we also know is that we don't have to raise their threshold terribly high to protect them from accidental exposures. As you can see from this um, graphic, if we can get patients able to tolerate 300 milligrams of a protein, which is about 10 milliliters of cow's milk, or one and a bit peanuts kernels, um, or if we can get them even more optimally to 1,000 milligrams of the protein, they are protected against almost all accidental exposures, which is a really huge bonus. Again, going back to the amount of fear that some families have, if we can sort of know with nearly 100% confidence that they're protected against accidental exposures. So look, as I was mentioning, oral immunotherapy has been increasingly reported on and, and in different centers around the world worked on for the past two decades. And, and early on, about 10 or 12 years ago, um, the position for most allergy organizations was, look, this is a promising thing worthy of investigation, but we're not ready for this yet. It's not appropriate to be incorporating this into clinical practice. And, you know, there were a lot of clinics that were sort of doing this anyway, but overall the powers that be were frowning on this saying, you know, outside of research settings, really, we don't have enough data yet. As the decade moved on and more data emerged, the European Academy, for one, came out and said, look, we do think it's reasonable now to look at doing immunotherapy for some food allergens, specifically milk, egg, and peanut, 
in some children, but really we have to be careful about doing this in controlled setters that have a lot of experience doing things like food challenges and managing anaphylaxis. Now one thing that's kind of changed the landscape is a relatively new FDA approved product, not available here, but is now available in other parts of the world called Palforzia, which is a standardized peanut protein um, compound that's been used now and approved for kids 4 to 17 to treat peanut allergy. And what they showed is that about two thirds of these, these sort of school age children were able to tolerate 600 milligrams of protein uh, in a single dose and a thousand cumulatively after um, uh, six months of maintenance therapy. Now again, that at least protects them against accidental exposures, but that's still a relatively low success rate. And in children or adults, I guess 18 and over, it really didn't work. In a meta-analysis around that time, it was shown that oral immunotherapy was more likely to induce anaphylaxis than simple avoidance over that same time span. And the suggestion from this was probably still not ready for prime time use. But what really changed the game for us and my colleagues in Canada was this study that came out about five years ago now. And what they did is they looked in younger kids. They took kids who were under 36 months of age and they did peanut immunotherapy in this group. And what they showed is that two years of maintenance of 300 milligram, very low dose peanut immunotherapy, patients, about 80% of them were able to pass a food challenge at the end of the treatment. So we looked at that in Canada at the time, we had one of our annual meetings and a group of us sat around the table and looked at this study and said, we, we think we have to start doing this. So in Canada, we started a, a quality improvement project where we started offering peanut immunotherapy for our preschool age children who had shown clear reactions, failed early introduction of peanut as per the LEAP study that was alluded to earlier, where we try to get peanut into the diet early to prevent sensitization. And in those children who had failed that or had reacted uh, despite those attempts, we started doing peanut immunotherapy uh, in those age groups. And so in our first study, which looked at the safety of this approach in preschool kids, we had nearly 300 children involved. Um, many of whom had other food allergies, a significant percentage of which already had asthma. This is a very atopic um, population, of course. And in the patients who had, um, uh, almost all of them had had clear reactions or a baseline food challenge, and we used either peanut flour or a peanut puff called Bomba to try to get them up to the target dose. And what we saw is that 90% of the kids in our cohort were able to achieve maintenance dosing. And while a majority of them had reactions along the way, they were almost all very mild. And we had very little need to administer epinephrine. In fact, it was less than three doses of epinephrine per 10,000 oral immunotherapy doses um, for these patients. So then, of course, following up on the safety data, we then published on the effectiveness data, now looking at almost 500 children as the cohort grew, who have now had a baseline unsuccessful challenge or convincing reaction to peanut during their dose escalation. And again, young children, median age 24 months, only 2% dropping out after achieving maintenance dosing, so a very high retention rate. And what you can see here is that, and, and the middle curves is a logarithmic scale, their baseline threshold went from around 50 micrograms of peanut, so about a fifth of a peanut kernel, all the way up to over 4,000 milligrams of peanut protein after a year of maintenance immunotherapy in our group. We had 98% of our cohort able to tolerate 1,000 milligrams minutes. after treatment. And again, that protects them against nearly 100% of accidental exposures and nearly 80% of the cohort able to tolerate 4,000 milligrams of peanut at the end of that um, period. And that led us to the conclusion that preschool children seem to have a milder peanut allergy phenotype than older kids. And it seems to be much safer and more effective to look at doing peanut immunotherapy in that age group. Looking at the cost effectiveness of this, what we see is that while in the very short term, peanut immunotherapy increases the risk of requiring epinephrine, there are significant long-term benefits of it, and that both costs and epinephrine use would be significantly decreased by employing peanut immunotherapy in this young age group. 
And so in Canada, we've now published oral immunotherapy guidelines where we now say that oral immunotherapy is indicated for patients with IgE-mediated food allergy, and it can achieve desensitization, and in a smaller percentage, uh, um, we can induce tolerance. So in our most recent publication from just earlier this uh, fall, we're now making a very strong case that in children, infants who fail early peanut introduction, I hope you're all counseling your patients, families, especially those with atopic dermatitis or a family history of atopy, to start introducing peanut very early, preferably around six months of age on a regular basis. It's gotta be at least twice a week to have a beneficial effect. And in those children who fail early introduction, we should be rolling them into peanut immunotherapy pretty much immediately. It's never going to be a safer and more effective time to do so than in those very, very youngest of children. So with that, I'm gonna just close by mentioning that we again should be considering oral immunotherapy for very young children. A lot of the earlier studies, we think we're looking at the wrong age group where the allergy has become more intractable, more solidly entrenched, and the immune system is less manipulable. So we really need to be looking in that preschool toddler age group. We can induce desensitization in almost all cases, and we may be able to induce long-term tolerance in a significant percentage of the younger children. It's safe and more effective in younger children than in older children. However, it does require specialist care, a lot of education, and shared decision making. These are not just sort of spur of the moment decisions. We have to spend a lot of time counseling our families so they understand what they're getting into and what sort of the commitment is and, uh, and what to expect from this. And I really can't emphasize enough, uncontrolled asthma is an absolute contraindication to oral immunotherapy. So any patients that we're seeing for this have to have either perfectly well-controlled asthma or of course no asthma. And sometimes that can be a bit of a barrier for families who are a bit resistant to considering controller therapy, in which case oral immunotherapy is a non-starter for some of those children. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. And I guess we are now gonna have a, a question session for the program. Thank you.